You're listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Good evening, one and all. This is the X Zone, and I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you live and around the world from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Worldwide toll-free, 1-800-610-7035. Our email address is xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. On all social media sites, TV, and our radio website, where you can listen to the Exxon Monday through Friday from 8 p.m. until midnight live from our studios here. And the rest of the week, the rest of the time, the rest of the clock, you can listen to the best of the Exxon at www exxoneradiotv.com I've got a question for each and every one of you out there tonight. Do you have fear of the future? Or maybe you fear the past. How can you enjoy the fear of the future? How can you make the shift from life crisis to personal transformation? Now all of these are valid questions and ones we have asked ourselves continuously. Either the way you look at it, fear is a four letter word that is in the sand in the machinery of life. Well, how do we keep the machine running in the right direction? Well, in CXO Nation, here we found the solution. Our guest tonight is a resiliency expert. His name is Rich Wessenberg, and he reveals the antidotes to fear and how we can stand and should live fearlessly. He also continues to lean on his experiences as a former minister, sales representative, father, and husband to outline the solutions a person needs to find the hidden treasures of the believing heart. Joining me now is Rich Wessenberg. And Rich, welcome to the X Zone. Thank you so much, Rob. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great having you with us, Rich. Well, I have to ask you, Rich, you know, minister, sales representative, um, father, husband, and, and now you're teaching people about fear. What was your motivation? What put you on the path to teaching people about fear? Like, I can understand the salesman, because the sale starts when the person says no, right? Well, that's true. And, you know, uh, it's kind of like this parallel journey of my whole life Mm -hmm. in the marketing sales world. I'm actually the state sales manager in the state of Wyoming for the federal health program here. And and then also as a former minister, Mm -hmm. so I had this dual kind of uh, growth pattern. But um, initially, uh, my book, Treasures of the Believing Heart, I wrote for my children. And then uh, because, like you say, fear uh, is something that is, is pretty common. Yeah. Most people know, hey, and, and see somebody in fear, and sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, it can be good. Sure. <laughs> but a lot of times it can work against us. Now, psychologists are telling us uh, that fear is a necessary part of our existence, that we need to fear in order to excel. Well, you know, I think uh, there's a moderation in, mm-hmm. in, in the way you look at it. Um, for me, you know, to start out the conversation and where my where I'm, you know, having an antidote for yeah. fear, um, you know, my, my book is going to take the discussion and put it into uh, the number one selling book all time, which is the Bible, according to Guinness Book of World Records. And so when my yeah. book is dealing with that book and what it has to say about fear, because that's what I wanted my kids to know, mm-hmm. and now I've been on a bigger journey, which the whole world to know. And so when you look at it this way, Rob, we're talking about uh, on the inside, inside our hearts, mm-hmm. not the physical heart pumping, but in our minds. Right. And when we look at these things, the, my book, even the title, Treasures of the Believing Heart, treasures is a term since used in antiquity, but biblically it's talking about what we would say today as core values. Mm-hmm. And so when somebody, whatever it is, I mean, fear to me is more of a symptom of the path towards hate 
because what I try to make a point of in, in my book and right off, you know, let's get this out the, out the gate right off the start, is that okay. the love of God in the Bible is the number one greatest commandment. And to fulfill that, it says you'll love your neighbor as yourself. And so my point is, is that as that is a, ca- as a core value, the Bible says, hey, perfect love casts out fear. And that's talking about as we mature in our love for God and the things that we do when we work hard or in my marriage or I do my job, like, my goodness, in the marketing sales field, yeah. boy, you can be very fearful. But sure I can, can tell you in 30 years that I've been in it, never failed at it. Always hit my quotas, and um, so. But when you apply it in our lives, we want to be successful as parents, successful, mm-hmm. successful as uh, as a husband and wife. And I think these fears, fears of the future, these things where uh, we don't have answers, then I would turn around, and now you're kind of getting in the category of purpose that uh, may be able to give answers to those those concerns. Why is there such a high percentage of fear when it comes to the unknown, Rich? Well, I say, you know, look at that particular question, and um, you know, the Bible does talk about when there's no vision, people wander aimlessly. And so when the unknown, I mean, you're, you know, throw, so much can be thrown at you. And I can remember when I didn't really have a clear understanding uh, of, of really, you know, and you have multiple things you can choose out there. Uh, of what you think the future might be. Is there going to be, a, a, you know, a, a, another aliens coming in and taking over the, you know, for the, the future of, the, of mankind? Or, you know, whatever your belief is, is it, I'm going to evolve into a, you know, a caterpillar? Sure. I mean, there is a lot of different uh, options out there to consider. But that's where I like to bring the discussion to the core values and uh, those ones that are going to give you peace. And so to me, when we look at people, a high percentage of them, to me it represents a a lot of people that are wandering aimlessly, a better job of trying to figure out what this number one selling book is talking about in the future. And to me that represents, you know, a lot lot of lack of understanding or if people don't want to acknowledge that. But uh, obviously whatever they've been clinging to, uh, it hasn't been getting the job done for them. All right, so let me ask you this. Why is it important to be able to live fearlessly then? Well, it, it, it's available to, you know, we definitely want to be able to live fearlessly mm-hmm. because when we are not uh, bold, which to me is the opposite in the absence of fear in our believing hearts, then we have confidence. We're going to have trust. We're going to be um, in everything we say, everything that we do, um, you know, then we're going to be in a category of not only our core values in alignment so that now we're talking about in a spiritual realm where things can happen in our lives that, you know, you can't control. The things I can control and take care of, that's one thing. Right. But when the power of God, the power of light versus the power of darkness, mm-hmm. that's where when you get in that fear road, I mean, you, you know, if you, you if you sat there and just told yourself, I'm going to die every day, I'm going to die, tell yourself, uh, you know, and then eat, eat pounds of sugar and bad stuff for you, <laughs> you're going to reap the results of that. But if you're going to be confident and walk with love and take care of other people, your, your, your focus is going to even change. And so my point is, is that is going to allow God to be a part of your lives. The power of God is going to intervene in, in your life. And a lot of good things are going to happen where doors that used to be shut, they open up. And so you can live fearlessly, Rob. I really do believe you can. In today's society, with what's going on with uh, ISIS and the growing number of incident, incidents around the world that are that seem to be triggered by the Islamic religion, the Muslims, how does this fit in today's uh, philosophy when it comes to being a minister? And, and how can you tell people not to have fear when it comes to terrorism? Well, I think, you know, it would be foolish to not be on our guard. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think, you know, if somebody's out there really looking to harm us, but I would say there's nothing new under the sun, but I think in our day and time we've evolved into a situation where, you know, you talk about ISIS and, and you know, whatever religion has right. extremists in it. Sure. I mean, look back at our history. You could take any, you know, major religion and say, wow, look at the extremists, what they did there. We're in a day and time where, you know, uh, this particular, um, you know, extremist group <clears throat> under this category, the Muslim faith, 
Um, I, I look at it as, hey, you know, we've got to be on our guard. This is a different day and time where people are studying, you know, social media. They're studying where you live. And, you know, in my federal world, I work with federal agencies. Right. And they are definitely, um, it's, 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 they call it one-offs even, where they're, they're looking at, mm-hmm. you know, people directly and gathering information. So my point would be is that to eliminate fear, first of all, is we just have good respect for what we see around our world. I know I'm in a situation, but if my Muslim neighbor's next to me and he's been great to me and everything, Same thing here. And, you know, and, yeah. I, and I look at him and got power of gods and he's the best guy in the world. I've had customers who are Muslims, best guys in the world. But we're talking about a small percentage here. Yeah. Now, whatever they are, the exact number, but my point is is that we can't just go around and, and wrap everybody around that. And that's where I see you know, in the spiritual growth process, by that great core value, the love of God, and we take the journey of spiritual growth, well, the Bible tells us we're going to grow spiritually, to discern good and evil. And we're supposed to be able to do that. But, you know, we guard our hearts. We never totally open up our lives. But at the key point is that we can't, you know, close ourselves off and be isolated. Mm -hmm. I mean, every generation has to do that. But, you know, I, I think, you know, Rob, at the end of the day, to me, uh, this is, you know, obviously has grown in the picture of, 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 of how this particular organization is moving. And I think with that, we need to then step it up in our own protections. But at the same time, we just don't turn off from allowing that particular fear yeah. <laughs> to inhib- inhibiting us to be that good neighbor who loves his neighbor as himself, to be involved in my community. Oh, I'm, n- I'm not going to go out, the do- you know, I'm going to sure. lock myself in my closet. <laughs> I, I hear you. Uh, let me ask you, as, as a member, uh, as a minister, the Internet. I remember having Pastor Harry Walther on the show, oh, this has to be 10, 15 years ago, just when the Internet was starting. And he was convinced that WWW was the mark of the beast and WWW actually was the 666. Now, at the time, I thought he was a little off the wall. I'll be honest with you, Rich. But over the years, doing this show, watching what has gone on in the world, based on the information flow on the Internet. And, you know, people think, well, if it's on the Internet, it's got to be true. That's the biggest laugh of all, because in my opinion, the Internet is the biggest septic tank that man has ever created, because there's more crap in it than there is anything else. How has, in your opinion, dealing with members of a parish and, or a, the, your parishioners, and, and those who seek counsel to you as a, as a member of the clergy, how have you seen the Internet affect people in a positive way and, or in a negative way, or does it just depend on the person who's using it? I'm going to have to go with the person who uses it, mm-hmm. you know, because, uh, you know, we're supposed to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You know, yeah. it, it, when we're growing up spiritually and no matter – you know, and if we put it in into the category of, hey, I'm working with my congregation, and everybody's always everybody's a work in progress. Yeah. And, and I love what you said. You know, the internet to me, I mean, it would be like walking into a magazine rack too. You know, and there's all different magazines, except it's on my computer screen. Exactly. And you know, and you can pick whichever one you want. Heck, that's that's how it was when I was growing up. But now today, we've got it. So so what? I can click through it, and I see the headline. And the key is, and heck, and, you know, it's funny. I was thinking, just it hit my mind. It was like, because I would grow up, my mom would buy those Esquire magazines, yeah, and her yeah. her mom would sit there and talk. Well, you know, so and so is doing this and that. Mm-hmm. But my point is, is that. You know, you're, you're right. I, I think uh, uh, there is uh, a lot of information out there, but we've got to develop the ability. And, and I can tell you, my kids growing up through the school systems, my daughter's 17, my son 15, these kids aren't stupid about the Internet. And, and the thing is, is that uh, those people who do fall prey to it, mm-hmm. you know, there, there can be some truth to that, you know, sure. the sucker born every minute. Yeah. But the key is, is that, uh, you know, the foolish man or the wise man, every moment we've got to make that decision. And so I think we need to develop good filter systems. We should have backup systems before we do anything, reliable people to double check ourselves when you get on that Internet, because not only is there bad stuff, but there so some good things out yes, there, there and good knowledge, too. 
and and it's just this world we live in. The Bible calls it. It is crooked. You know, you you know, make the crooked straight. But at the mm-hmm. same time, there's good stuff, and we just got to navigate through it. Excellent nation. My guest uh, this hour is Rich Wasserman and uh, Wassenberg. I'm sorry, and he's the author of a very interesting book. And we're talking about that book this hour. The name of his book is Rich. Treasures of the Believing Heart. There, you heard it right from the author's mouth, Exo Nation. Uh, if you'd like to get a copy or for more information, visit tatepublishing.com forward slash bookstore. Now, you say that perseverance is an integral part of getting through life's obstacles. Why? Well, you know, the, when we look at perseverance, mm-hmm. and, 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 and I like to call it staying power. <laughs> I like that too. Because yeah. it... You know, there are some people, you know, when you long, work a long career and you'd be like looking at that same guy show up at work and man, and how does he get through that exactly. stuff? Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, we're all built differently. Yep. Uh, but to me, the one thing that uh, I love what's come out of this book is Treasures of a Believing Heart. We all have a believing heart. And those core values that are in there, you know, uh, you know, the Bible talks about faith, hope, and love. And I had one reviewer call it a great study on core values, principles, and purpose. And so, you know, circling back to this pers- perseverance, mm-hmm. these people who have the staying power and good examples of it, you, you really see that, uh, you know, they, they, they learn patience. And, you know, we are either A or B personalities. You look at, at situations, and I think, you know, I'm definitely an A uh, and, and we've got to realize our strength and our weaknesses in ourselves. But the bottom line, it doesn't change the kind of core values that we should discipline ourselves to and the principles involved. And so, you know, when we face obstacles and those who are challenged with them, which can turn into fear, mm-hmm. and now, to me, you're drifting further away from the love of God in our hearts because God will make a way to escape for us. And that's the big lesson to take away from the Bible. Moses hit the Red Sea, pretty big obstacle. But God's no respecter of persons, so he parted it for us. We're all going to face our Red Seas, and, you know, whatever Pharaoh is behind our back ready to, you know, put a couple of uh, knives in us, you know, the key is is that we got to look to God. He's going to make a way to escape, and the key is is to be patient. And I think there's a lot of lack of patience today, Rob. I don't think a lot of people, were like the Internet, so much self-gratification. But I think when you get around yeah. somebody who's a farmer, I grew up on a farm in northern Wisconsin. My goodness, you never looked at, you know, hey, you know, the cow got pregnant. It's going to take time to have the baby. <laughs> the same thing in life. <laughs> and, uh, you know, have the calf. And, they, you know, I had kids. Things just don't happen overnight spiritually. But that's where I say that power, the power that needs to get over our obstacles to re- re- is to remember that it sometimes takes time for the power of God to energize and get those results. Uh, the key is, is we always want to be prepared in our hearts. And if we're weak and see we're weak, not only to fix ourselves, but get around others who are going to help us stay strong. Um, how do you teach a child? Like you're a dad, I'm a dad, I'm a, I've got nine grandchildren and six children. So, so tell me, how could I teach my grandchildren now to be resilient? Well, the definition of resilience is, is the ability to bounce back after something bad has happened. Like getting back and my on, goodness, you know. <laughs> getting back on the horse after you fall off. You know, they, yeah, they learn real early, you know, sure. walking is falling and catching yourself before you hit the, hit the ground. And kids learn early about, you know, uh, definitely tumbling and, and things. They're little lessons along the journey. But as they be able to understand, mm-hmm. uh, parents, to me, that's really a great opportunity. When you make the vow to become a husband and wife and then want to even get to the next level of having a family, and my God, Rob, how blessed you are. Nine grandchildren. Nice. Oh, my gosh, I'm believing for that day. Anyway, uh, uh, it starts out with that husband and wife, and, and of course, it, 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 and, and then their individual relationships, mm-hmm. and being a good example to those kids. Now, not everybody is a great teacher, but a lot of things happen in the home. And that's where it's going to start. You know, I, you see all the social problems that we have. I've known bringing my kids to the schools isn't any day and time probably when, when you had your kids. But yeah. when we see families that are weak, it's going to start in the family. Now, granted, it's not in every situation. Children can make their own decisions, too. But at the end of the day, 
you know, when we can develop a, a good examples and not walking past things, when we see things with our children, parents need to stand up, correct them, yeah. and then be able to show what is right. And, and you know, it's, it's a spiritual growth development process, but, you know, you plant the good seeds of truth. And, uh, you know, one of the promises the Bible says, if you teach the child the way he should go, he will not depart from it. And you claim, you claim these promises. That's what I'm doing. And, you know, I've just seen a lot of good things happen doing it. Kids today are, are facing problems each and every day. When I went to school, I'm sure it was the same when you went to school, we didn't have to walk through metal detectors. We didn't have police officers patrolling the halls. You know, we didn't have cell phones. It was called a dime. In case you needed help, you put a dime in something called a telephone, and you you had that little funny dial that would have all the numbers and alphabets, and that's what you used to call. We weren't used to instantaneous gratification, instantaneous results like the kids of today are. Are the children of today, in your opinion, being force-fed too much information, and are they getting old before their time? Well, I would have to say, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, but but because of our technology mm-hmm. and the things, these kids have, are more open to, like you say, a lot of information, and to me, distraction and then uh, temptation. Uh, no matter what category you want to pick. I mean, uh, I see it with my kids. I've seen horrible situations happen with, you know, people because they can just snap a picture or a yeah. video, and the next thing, everybody knows it. Yeah. I mean, that's one of these that's just part of our day and time. And so I look at it again. Uh, these children are definitely faced with a different world that we live into. I was doing an interview just uh, yesterday. My gosh, it so shocked me. You know, when I first started taking my kids to local elementary school, and there are 50 cars all parked around. Nobody walks to school anymore, Rob. Everybody's got to take their kid and be right there to pick them up. Wow. And I don't know about you growing up, but when I grew up, my mom used to say, you know what, maybe somebody will take you. But the thing is about today is somebody probably will. Yep. <laughs> so definitely there's a lot of uh, more uh, aggressive evil out there, and I think uh, the kids – Def, uh, uh, need to, and they teach it in the schools, hey, you know, you you got to watch this stuff. So, again, it's raising these kids up in the home, mom and dad, watching. You, know, you cannot just let the world train up your kids. You can't let the media do it. You've got to be involved with your kids. You've got to know what they're doing and have an honest relationship with them. I, I think with my kids at their teenage years, they're immature. And kids, you know, the Bible tells us there's foolishness bound in the heart of the child. I know that. Sure. You know, they just don't have enough experience to know what the outcome of these paths that they can get tripped up on. But if a parent is on their job, got power, got to work on them. You snuff out these yeah. things, get them on the right road, good things will happen. When I was a kid, and I'm sure the same as in your case, supper was at the table with mom and dad. We exchanged information. We talked about our days. Uh, there was a hierarchy that was followed in the house. There was something called respect. You know, it was, you looked forward to mom and dad sitting down at the table at supper time unless you did something wrong, and then you weren't that happy because mom would tell dad, and dad was the, the enforcer, and, uh, you know, dad took care of the problems. Discipline. It seems to be missing from the family, from the majority of family units. It seems that uh, um, family virtues and family ties have been replaced by iPods, iPads, and video games. What is this doing to the family structure when it comes to spirituality? I think it breaks it down. When you look at this, whenever you can start isolating. And like you said, that family unit, Mm -hmm. we're talking about then, you know, hey, we're together and moving as one. And so when everybody's off in their own orbits, and it happens with us, and my wife and I, we both use social media, um, and and we've got, you know, one of the big lessons in the Bible, there's moderation in all things, and you can enjoy something, but once you drift past the point of, you know, now this is affecting my time that I can spend with my kids or my kids being responsive to my uh, parents, you know, that's when, and we've done that, 
you know, hey, you know what? You've spent too much time. And that, again, or myself, to correct myself, hey, I've gone past a line here yeah. that is being detrimental. And to me, this is all in the subject of treasures of the believing heart. It's all believing. And it's bad believing when you cross those marks, and that's where consequences will be involved. And so when you talk, it's so, so important with the parents involved, because you mentioned discipline. And, you know, mom really sees everything going on in the house. And the, and the dad, he's going to be the, the tour of the line guy. And, uh, but if nobody's, you know, standing on the wall, well, heck, you know, the village is going to get run over. And so that's what you see in these family breakdown situations. But I think, you know, you're hitting a, a vital point that's happening in our culture. And um, uh, we need to, who want to be strong families in believing, because, uh, you know, you, you get one shot to being a parent. And there, there are rewards on the line. I mean, you know, that's part of the purpose point of it. But not only for that, you love your kids, man. You want to be a part of them. They do grow up fast. You've got nine grandkids. I'll bet, I'll bet you it was just like yesterday. I know for me, I was cutting the cord, and now i got my daughter tops in the car and drives exactly. down the street. Yeah, I, I, I hear you, my friend. I hear you. Rich, you and I have to take a commercial break with the news at the bottom of the hour. Please stand by. Great having you with us. Great topic. Oh. Exo Nation. Rich Wassenberg is our special guest. He is the author of the Treasure, Treasures of the Believing Heart. That's Treasures of the Believing Heart. It's available at tatepublishing.com forward slash bookstore. This is the Exo. I am Rob McConnell. And as we know, 25 years into the, I was going to say the rain, but this isn't rain. This is programming at its best right around the world. This is a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. This is a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And Rich and I will be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news as we continue talking about treasures of the believing heart. My name is Rob McConnell. Don't go away. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Wilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we will weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Wilda Wiaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Jesus came back now and insisted that we listen to him. How would the world be different if Christians really followed the Gospels? For 2,000 years, we've been practicing a religion. Now it's finally time to get it right. Read Liberating Jesus, new from Roberta Grimes. Meet the Jesus you never knew. Roberta uses afterlife evidence and biblical analysis to prove that Jesus is exactly right. Learning the lessons that he came to teach is the reason we are born at all. Roberta says he has come back now to insist that we actually listen to him so we can begin to use his teachings to unite and transform the world. Liberating Jesus wherever books are sold. Jesus has the answers and it's not too late. Roberta blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Linnea Starr 
began to demonstrate a metaphysical connection to the spirit world as a little girl. Her family noticed the connection, but it was a great-grandmother who told the family that Linnea was indeed gifted. The great-grandmother, who was also gifted, felt that Linnea had indeed inherited these attributes. It has been noticed that oftentimes, such things are passed down through the generations. Linnea was also born with a call, a thin white membrane across a newborn's face. Legend has it that if the baby is born with this call, the child will have second sight, or what we call psychic abilities. Linnea's star does past, present, and future, and has the gift of prophecy. It is written within scriptures that if you are able to give factual information, and prophecies indeed come true, the gift indeed comes from the divine realm. Linnea Star does large interactive groups as well as private gatherings. For more information on Linnea Star or to contact Linnea for a one-on-one -on -one consultation, visit her website at www.linneastar.com. That's www.l-i-n-n-e-a-s-t-a-r.com. Thomas Jefferson was a Burgess of 27 when he met Martha Whale Skelton, a 22-year-old widowed heiress who was fondly called Patty by her family. They were married on January the 1st, 1772, and they took up residence in a cabin on the building site on top of a Virginia mountain that Thomas had named Monticello. As Thomas and Patty slowly built their first version of the great house at Monticello, the Revolutionary War was heating up. Patty, with difficulty, bore five children, but only two girls survived. Thomas's political career developed to the point where he was often away from home, but after he authored and signed the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia, he resolved never again to leave his wife. He was elected the governor of Virginia, just as that state became the revolution's last battleground. The Revolutionary War ended in 1781, and Thomas gladly retired altogether to my family, my farm, and my books. But Patty continued to want to bear her treasured husband a son, and late in the summer of 1782, she died of kidney failure at the age of 33, four months after having born yet another girl. Thomas was so devastated by her death that he never remarried. He mourned her for the rest of his life, even as he helped to frame the peace in France and then became the first Secretary of State, the second Vice President, and the third President of the United States. This story is true. Thomas Jefferson was such an obsessive letter writer and record keeper that we know where he was and what he was doing nearly every day of his adult life. Every significant thing he says in My Thomas comes from his contemporary writings. My Thomas by Roberta Grimes is now available at Barnes & Noble, Costco, Target, Books A Million, Hudson Booksellers, Kmart, Walmart, Sam's Club, Walgreens, CVS, and online at Amazon.com. You can visit Roberta Grimes online at www.robertagrimes.com. <laughs> You're listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. Welcome back, everyone. This is The Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. My guest this hour is Rich Wessenberg, and he is the author of Treasures of the Believing Heart. You can get a copy of uh, Rich's book at www.tatepublishing.com forward slash bookstore. As an author, Rich, what was the hardest part of writing this book? Well, um, 
You know, when when you look at getting a book done, you're really not sure what you have and um, until others take a look at it. And to me, I think once that that part was really hard, and mm-hmm. uh, 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 because the book right now is 148 pages, but when I did the first draft manuscript, <laughs> it was 948 pages. And so, uh, you know, when you look at things uh, on the computer versus on which is in book form, it's double. And so, uh, I was learning. What my point bringing that up is, is there's this learning process that you go through, and if you're just like me, a first time author. Um, and going through those critiques, because your heart is just out there. Sure. <laughs> and and I just did it for my kids, so uh, I was just. Um, uh, but you know, on the other side of the coin, my business side of me was like always used to being critiqued all the time, so mm-hmm. that was able to handle it. But this was new in the book situation. If you wrote it for your kids, and how many children do you have? Two. I have two. Why did you decide to publish it? Well. And that's, you know, part of the great part of the story was, mm-hmm. is I had no agenda when I wrote the book to being published. The thought was not even in my heart. Um, true story. I'm, uh, I'm a triathlete. Yep. And uh, I was just uh, at the swimming pool one day, and a guy goes, you know, uh, what do you do on your spare time? And he's swimming next to me, and, and he was a friend. He's an attorney at the state here. And, and I was just like, uh, well, I just said right now, you know, just for – Fun. I've been writing a book for my kids. I just want to pass it on to him. He's like, really? He goes, how's it going? I go, well, I'm just wrapping it up. You know, I probably should have somebody just check it out, you know, spelling and, you know, edit it. Yeah. And that's when the door opened. He turned around and had a friend. He goes, I know somebody who loves to do that kind of stuff. When, once other people got involved, Rob, that's where it turned around. This gentleman just happened to be a, a Supreme Court attorney consultant in Colorado and Wyoming. And then he's like, wow, you got some really good stuff here. But he was a published author himself, and he invited me to lunch, and we talked for a couple hours, and that's really where the journey started. Is is it fair to say, Rich, that this is where you became aware of the journey? But is it possible that a power, a divine power, had planted that seed, well knowing that this seed was going to bear the fruit that you call your book? I, I, I'm convinced of it now because at the time I just, you know, didn't didn't have that agenda. Mm-hmm. It was just purely when I, every chapter, everything in the book, it was it's like this is what I know about believing because what I learned about believing too, the purpose in the book. On the marketing side, I've been in charge of a lot of marketing departments. I've seen the principle of believing, and you know, and I'm around all these self help guys, and I get the you know because I work for a large large insurance company. They'll put the best guys in front of us all the time, and you know, and I'll hear them teach these things, and I'm just sitting there, and I'm like, you didn't come up with that principle. That's, that's in the Bible. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and I knew it backwards and frontwards, and mainly the law of believing and how that's broken down, and a lot of people don't know that, where I would turn around and say, you know, the Bible, which I do in the book, it, it exhorts us to be experts at believing. And there's allegories how it's taught, or Jesus even teaching, you know, point blank, if you had, you know, believing as a mustard seed, you know, you could stand on this mountain, it'll jump in the ocean. But, you know, I try to help people understand these are, you know, figures of speech and allegories to sh- show that law, how it works. It's at work. And it's so critical. So, you know, circling back to, you know, the book, that mm-hmm. it, that's, that's really what I'm trying to bring to the surface. So I wanted my kids to become, you know, not only because my wife and I would teach our kids when they first could understand it. This book really came from on our beds teaching them at night, and then I was like, man, I'm learning new stuff that I never knew before, and I know nobody's teaching this stuff. And on the commercial side, you know, the positive thinking and all the stuff, they always ceiling out at spirituality. And I'm like, well, I don't want them to just get that route. I want them to know the whole thing, Mm -hmm. and that's why I put the book together. 600 pages? 300 pages? I'm sorry. It's it's 148 pages, but the first draft. Oh, I see. (laughs) Yeah, I... uh, you know, one of my long suits is teaching and instructing, and so, but, mm-hmm. you know, he had told me, you know, had gone through the journey himself, uh, Tim uh, Newberry, who's, you know, he's actually listed in the book as one of the people who, um, you know, give me credit, and um, anyway, uh, you know, uh, he, he, he told me, uh, you know, gave me all the tips on editing, because mm-hmm. one of the great things is to throw out a tip to, you know, people thinking about becoming authors and listening to your commercials out there, people who are authors, you know, uh, writing a book is, 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 is very therapeutic in a lot of ways, but there's a lot of things to understand and learn about it, so take classes on it. 
But the key that I'm really getting to is when you do want to produce some material, and if it was your goal to get published, the, the goal would be is then have it ready, sale ready when you turn it to a publisher. Because I, 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 I'll tell this to people, I'll say, you know, well, I wrote a book, I'm believing. <laughs> but I sent it out to three publishers, and I had a contract in three weeks. Mm-hmm. And some, I've read, you know, the book MASH. Uh, that guy sat on it for five years till somebody, you know, got a publishing contract. And because I would, you know, part of my publishing journey was they'd have me read and study how other books, their journeys and, and, and all that was involved. And so I've learned a lot about a lot of authors. And so my point is, is do your due diligence before you show up to the publisher. And that'll really up the ante that you're actually going to get published. In a world where a lot of people are self-publishing. How does the how does the self publish versus the publisher publishing um, business work? You know, and I've had people come approach me who are self published, mm-hmm. and so or or that journey and trying to cross over into that realm. I, I think you bring up a big question. Their comp their competition to me it'd be almost like in the healthcare industry that I work in. You have the holistic industry and you yeah. have traditional medicine, and they're both out there, and it's the buyer's choice. And so to me, publishers, uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, need, you know, they do see it and they've got to make money themselves. And so mm-hmm. these people who have good material out there, um, you see them. Yeah, they're going to these other resources. And, and the bottom line is the consumer is going to be judge, jury, and verdict and where they spend their dollar. And so uh, all I can tell you on the publishing side is it, it gave me access to a lot of things. That there's no way I could have taken sure. the time to be published worldwide. My book's on Amazon. You books a million. You mentioned all these yeah. guys, and I'm like, man, they did that for me too. It's all out there. Yeah, one thing that, one thing that I've noticed, whether it's a, a published author or whether it's a self-published author, they say, well, geez, I'm on Amazon. And I say, that's nice. Because everybody's on Amazon. Amazon used to be something that is really great. But now with nearly 20,000 new books being published a month, like how do, how do you defeat a market? And I'm looking at the information that your publicist sent us. Consistently ranked in the top 20% users on social media. Now, how do you do that? Well, you know what? One of the great lessons from the Bible, and I remind myself, our God words of me to say, you got to work hard. I will tell you, just like I read your biography, Rob, you know in the business you've you got to work hard, and, and no matter what industry you're in, but if you're going to be an author and think that you're going to sit in a chair and, and you're going to just evolve into Stephen King, you might want to rethink that. <laughs> that you know, These guys have worked really, really hard and networked and got with yeah. good people that have gotten to them where they're at. That. It's not a solo journey at any means. But get back to like me at the top 20% mm-hmm. in social media. I mean, I work Twitter. Twitter is one of my biggest uh, ways to reach the world. Uh, and I was, I, you know, before this, Rob, I was the guy, because I'm old school. I was like, I can remember showing up at work even and be like, my uh, CEO of the company was like, well, are you out on Facebook or any of that stuff? And I'm like, heck no, I live off the radar. Yeah. But not anymore. And I have 36,000 followers now, and I work it every day, and I try to believe to put inspirational tweets out there. And so get back to your question is, you want to be an author, there's a lot of things you got to do. you got to do those book sales. You've got to be in it. You know, one lesson is, mm-hmm. is just do something good once every day, and those good harvests will be there for you. You know what I love about you? Your, your stamina, your drive, you get it. It's not going to come to you unless you go chasing it. So true. And that's just a great lesson of life. Yeah. And I think that instant gratification where they think they can click and they'll see somebody and see some great outcome, but not go back and research and, and, and find out what that guy's journey was. Mm-hmm. I had one um, book review, uh, Worldwide Gospel News, um, compared, um, oh gosh, and i got to think of the name of that book. Um, but anyway, it was a top 10. It was a number one in USA Today in like 2007. Right. And the bottom line, I got this comparison in this re- uh, review. And, um, and then I went back and I talked to my publisher about it. I was like, man, how did this book, you know, did, you know was it just all great? And he goes, listen, this was the journey. This guy didn't even get a publishing contract for the first two, three years. He went in his garage and printed out copies, and he went to every church, and then went to every church, you know, outside of his area, went to every state, and, and, he, and he was just self-selling all the way through. And then he struck a gold mine. This was in the, you know, gospel area, and all of a sudden a mainline denomination picked up his book, and whammo. And so my point is, 
Yep, that journey of hard work paid off for him. So many times I, I speak to authors, and you know they're 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 telling me their their story, and the one thing that they all, the majority, I should say, miss, is that if you're going to self-publish, you need to get an unbiased opinion of your book, because. I say, well, who you know, who have you who who have you showed it to? Who has read it? Well, my sister, my brother, my family, my coworkers, they're they're all giving me great reviews. Who outside your circle has read your book? Uh, no one. But I know it's going to be a million dollar seller. This is a big problem I see in today's publishing market. The people, the authors, the authors wannabes. My Lord, I, I can tell you horror stories about self-published books that we get here, and we get about 40 books a, a week here. It's enough to make your hair turn white. Wait a minute. My hair is white. No wonder it's white. <laughs> you know, but, but you've taken the right road. You see, I, well, you're, the kind, you're the kind of guy that, that I see is, is a little bit like myself. You see, when I have a failure, I don't give up. I look at that as a lesson. And Lord knows I've had many failures, but I've always gotten up got back on that horse, looked at the failure as as a lesson, and you keep on going. Oh, so true. And I looked at your career and your bio. Oh, my goodness. Um, and, and that you're doing it now at this part of your life is such mm-hmm. an inspiration to me. And so that, you know, get back to these guys that, yeah, uh, yeah they, they've got to put the work in. It, you, this, this grandiose... Uh, these guys that do make it on top are some of the hardest working people on the planet. And that's what I've learned is, yeah. is seeing, you know, when I'm getting a little higher and then I see the work that these guys are doing and I'm like, you know what, that's kind of how hard I worked at my regular job. And, yeah. and, and when you're doing two things, being, you know, I'm doing this and then mm-hmm. I'm doing that, uh, being an author on the side and thinking, wow, like you said, you know, this vision in my mind. Um, and, and you're right about the, uh, you know, I've got the best selling thing. To, and then when I wrote my book, because this is my field, I teach it. I was like, you know, this has got to be a rock solid product. And, and, and I had a lot of people who, who read it and, and outside of my circle, and they would say, you know, uh, this, this is really good stuff. And so once you can pass those things, you never know until it really totally gets out there. But there's right. little steps along the journey. But that is your passion. That is why you are a success. Plus, when you look at another book where the authors have put so much hard work, lifelong dedication, and passion, I think it's called the Bible. Yeah, that's it. There you go. That is the greatest. Number one selling book all time. That's right. That's right. And you know what? It has great stories in it. It's the greatest book ever written for a number of reasons. You know them, I know them. People who know them in their heart know the reasons. But it was the passion of the authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Moses, and the list goes on and on and on. They were passionate about what they wrote. It was their life. They had the trials, the tribulations that made that book into the number one selling book. Because if it wasn't passion, if it wasn't truth, If it wasn't life's experience, the book would have gone nowhere. But you, my friend, have incorporated, in my opinion, the formula of success because of your life, your passion, your goals, your desire, and your resiliency. Well, thank you so much, Rob. And, and you know, you're, you're so right. And the Bible is to be examples to us. Mm-hmm. And these guys, the power of God worked in holy men of God spoke as the power of God worked in them to write those scriptures Peter talks about. And these guys were real life, flesh and blood, yep. and they had to overcome obstacles. And that's what they talked about. And so, uh, you know, that's why I think uh, that book, um, well, power of God in it, and uh, we have so much we can learn and draw from it. What's your next project, my friend? Well, I am working on another book, and um, you know, and I'm just working on the chapters, really. And so uh, that's the that's one project. The other project is kind of like what I'm doing now. I do love to speak and get out and promote. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the business, it's all about exposure at, at parts of the journey, and that's yeah. you know where I see myself right now. 
And, um, uh, and, and I think, you know, for other people who are authors, I think that's, you know, you got to look at this as, as trying to not only book sales and, and like being on shows like yours and then really taking those talents and abilities, letting people know, uh, on a, on a show. And so, uh, I'm doing a lot of radio. I just did a, a yesterday Nightline in South Carolina on a TV show. It's going to be all on the Eastern Seaboard of the United States. Um, I've got another uh, TV show on public TV in New York City, and that was through Twitter. You know, you got to network and make yeah, connections. You sure do. I think that's a, that's a key one in all industries. You, you did that throughout your career. I certainly did. Yep. Uh, I my my friends and family used to call me a media prostitute. <laughs> and I'm, I'm using a polite word there. The word that they used to call me starts with a W-H and ends with an R-E. Uh-huh. Okay? Yeah, well, that's that's the way you do it in our business, and, yep. and I think it applies to anything if you're going to have something to outreach the rest of the world. That it's pas- just the truth. That fire in your belly is what pushes you. The passion, the belief of what you have and your desire to spread the word, that's where success lies. And don't look at anything as a failure. Always look at it as a lesson in life. Amen to that. So are you going to write another book? Yes, I am. Um, you know, you talked about the kids, and I've had so many book sales inter- act, interacting with the public. And so I think there's a lot of things, you know, one I was thinking about when the question about raising the kids, because mm-hmm. I think there's more to bringing up to the surface, like the goal with the book. But now I can see I've got a bigger public that I'm serving is to get some of these great teachings about how to raise these kids um, also, you know, there's so many things about the Bible that people don't understand. Uh, you know, before Moses wrote the Bible, you know, in first book anyway, uh, those first five books, <clears throat> you know, you look at, or even the book of Job, uh, the oldest book, you, you, there was 2,500 years estimated that there was no Bible, and how the stars, you know, there's great teachings, and there's a lot of uh, books out there, but I want to put it into um, a total package where people can understand how, you know, God's uh, message of reconciliation through uh, the Savior, the Messiah, is up in the stars. Today, we call them the 12 signs of the Zodiac, but actually in the Bible, it says the Maseroth. I think this is kind of cool stuff. You start talking to astronomers, and they get it, but there are a lot of astronomical um, uh, references in the Bible that we should understand. Uh, not that we, you know, uh, I'm going to worship the stars or anything, but there wasn't by coincidence that the wise men showed up when they did looking for the Messiah. These teachings that were passed down from other believers like Daniel when they were taken over by um, Persia, and, uh, you know, they passed on these teachings. So there's just other areas, Rob, I'm just excited about. I'm going to get it all down in paper and um, hopefully get, uh, not hopefully, but <laughs> day by day, get that wrapped up, and uh, we'll see where it goes. All right. What is, what is your final message tonight for the worldwide listening audience of the Exxon? Well, I would say that, you know, there are so many good people around you, mm-hmm. and uh, there are, there's such a wonderful life to be lived. Life is such a great gift. And, you know, God has called all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. It's such a great privilege to be healthy and to have the abilities to think and believe, interact, no matter what country you're in or what circumstance you're in, you have the, God tells us in his word that you can rise up to your potential, no matter what it is. Whatever your calling is, the gift and calling of God, he has done it. And every one of us has a gift, and we have a responsibility to give that gift away. And how you do that is build a strong believing heart. Treasures of the believing heart is taking these lessons from the Bible. And you see these men that Rob talked about. These men in the Bible, Mark, Luke, John, the Apostle Paul, all these men and and, and women in the Bible, how they were able. And and, and they're not all listed in there. There's not everybody in there. But we're to be living epistles our own selves. And so take the opportunity to take this great number one selling book and learn it. It'll be a journey for the rest of your life. That's the great message of my book is take the treasures of God's Word and put them in your believing heart, and you'll be the best. You're going to be the best husband. You're going to be the best father. You're going to be the best employee. And uh, at the end of the day, there's eternal rewards just awaiting for you. Rich, I want to thank you ever so much for uh, joining us tonight here on the Exxon. If uh, the listeners would like to contact you, if they have questions for you, how can they reach you? 
you know, I have a number of ways. I'm out there at Rich Westenberg Facebook. I'm at, at Rich Westenberg on Twitter. You can email me at Rich Westenberg at gmail.com. Um, my author site is Treasures of the Believing Heart dot Kate Author dot com. And if you just Google Rich Westenberg, you're going to find a lot of ways to reach me. So, uh, I, uh, please contact me. I'd love to, to talk to you and help you in any way I can. Rich, you take care of yourself, my good friend. Look forward to the next time you join us here in the x and to you and yours, the very, very best of 2016. And thanks for doing what you do. Thank you so much, Rob. It was a pleasure. Take care, Rich. Once again, x Nation, our guest this hour has been Rich Wessenberg. He is the author of Treasures of the Believing Heart. And you can find out more about Rich by going to tatepublishing.com forward slash bookstore. I'll be back on the other side of the news at six and a half minutes past the top of the hour as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell. Don't go away. <laughs> 